Well, hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. In this video, I have Bishop Barron again, and he's going to be explaining anti-Christian bigotry. What do we do when the world mocks us? He's going to talk about the repetitive historical resistance to Christianity that has always been prevalent within the world. He's going to talk about, he's going to analyze conflicting worldviews and how it's good that we believe the antagonist. For example, he's going to get into the Olympics. It's good that we believe that they are antagonistic to a Christian worldview because Quite frankly, we are antagonistic to their worldview. It's good that they understand that. He's then going to get into a Christian concept of turning the other cheek and how important that is for uh, resisting the, the false and fraudulent worldviews that surround us every day. All right, let's go ahead and watch this clip and I will provide my reactions in the middle and during the clips, okay? It'll be a little bit different, but it'll be good. All right, let's go. So um, just to expand the context just a little bit, Bishop, uh, help us understand anti-Christian bigotry in a historical context. Have, have, have we ever as a church lived in a time or place where we haven't had to deal with some form of hostility? Right, I wasn't sure which direction your question was going, but once it went that way, I think, no, it, it's hard to name a time when there wasn't some kind of opposition to Christianity. Look from the very beginning, look in the pages of the Acts of the Apostles, you can see it. And the reason is Christianity is a public religion. Uh, it's never been a matter of simply um, our private convictions. It's not just like a hobby or a private conviction. When you say Jesus Christ is Lord, which is the basic evangelical proclamation, that's a public remark. You're saying not Caesar, but Jesus is Lord. That's to say Jesus is the one to whom your final allegiance is due. Jesus is the Lord of your life in all aspects thereof. Um, you can't avoid that being a public uh, uh, assertion. Well, that means it will be resisted in the public sphere. Look at when Paul preaches, we hear in the Acts of the Apostles, there were often riots that broke out. Paul was imprisoned eventually killed. Almost all the first great apostles and proclaimers of the faith were killed. It's because Rome understood exactly the implications of their preaching. They knew it was a subversive message. Now, move past the apostolic age into the first centuries, and you find, not at every moment, but you see waves of persecution in those first centuries. And then, you know, you want to bring it up to date? The century with by far the most Christian martyrs was the 20th century. Right. And we never think about that. We think, oh, way back when there were martyrs. No, no, no. 20th century, by far, by far, was the century of Christian martyrdom. Does it continue in the 21st century? Yes, absolutely. So to your question, I don't know if there's ever been a time when we haven't met with some public opposition, sometimes brutal. But it can be better or worse, right? Yeah, as I say, in the early days, it went kind of in waves. Um, and, and it depends on, on the culture. Sometimes the culture is more agreeable to Christianity. So maybe in the high Middle Ages, you know, when the culture and the church were in much greater alignment, okay, those happen, those moments. Other moments when they fall out of harmony. And then sometimes, again, Cardinal George, they become so antipathetic to each other that we have martyrs. So that's the spectrum that the church is always on. All right, so what's important to see here, I think, and what I'm taking away from it, is that there's always been ebbs and flows within history where there has been persecution that has kind of come in waves. The main thing that I want us to see in this particular part of the video is the fact that the 20th century produce the most martyrs. I think oftentimes when we think about persecution, we think about the early church, the very early church, the apostolic church, all the way back in the beginning. But the reality is that the most gruesome era to be a Christian, the, the most difficult era to be a Christian was in the 20th century. And so what we need to see is that in the 21st century, there will continue to be persecution. And as long as the Lord tarries, there, were, there will always be persecution. Why? Let's talk about, uh, now let's listen to Bishop Barron as he talks about, he kind of gives a philosophical analysis of conflicting worldviews as seen in the Olympics. And this will really help us to kind of have a whole encapsulated view of the issue that is at hand. Let's continue watching the clips. Turn to your Newsweek article. So you originally wrote it in response to the gross mockery of Christ in the Last Supper that took place in the opening ceremony to the um, yeah. 2024 Olympics in Paris. But your argument really is responding to a general resurgence of anti-Christian prejudice in the West. So let me read one of the key passages in the article and then ask you to expand on it. You write, Catholics affirm the existence of God, which means we think there is a transcendent purpose to human life. 
we affirm a stable human nature, which means we don't think sex is a social construct. And we hold to objective moral values, which means we don't think living the good life is simply a matter of personal choice. Mm -hmm. Chris, critics of Christianity know this, and that's why they deride us. They're telling us very clearly who they are and whom they're against, and we should believe them. So, Bishop, say more, uh, a little more about why you emphasize there at the end, we should believe them. It's a kind of a harrowing, harrowing quality to those words. Why did you choose them? Well, that there really is a, a conflict at a fundamental philosophical level. This is not a, a superficial conflict, but a, a conflict of worldviews. What you find very often on the stage today in the West is what I've called the culture of self-invention. For that to hold sway, well, God has to be marginalized because God is the source of, of transcendent value. Objective moral values have to be set aside because if they're really objective, they condition my will. I don't invent them. Um, religion is the great proponent of these things, which stand athwart the self-invention culture. And they, when I say they, I mean, let's say the, the leaders of, uh, of the secular culture, they understand that. They know that many institutions that oppose them have fallen, but the church, in the measure that is true to itself, it is still their great opponent. And so on a regular basis, they have to kind of call us out. They have to mock us. They have to belittle us. They have to try through law to marginalize us. Um, so when I say yeah, we should believe them, they're announcing through these actions and words that they know we stand athwart them. Um, believe them. They're, they, they have correctly intuited that we're the most significant opponent. Um, okay, you know, uh, the church, as we say, has long been involved in these cultural struggles. This is a version of it today. And given what they say and how they act, these uh, these these leaders of uh, secular culture, anti, or against the church, um, what do you think their ultimate goal is with this mockery and this marginalization? It's to eliminate the church. I mean, that is the ultimate goal. Um, first, to kind of marginalize us, um, privatize us. That's been a strategy for a long time, is to say, sometimes, you know, cloaking themselves in, in the pious language of, of the Western democracies, like, well, you know, we, of course, acknowledge religious liberty, but that means you can whisper your convictions among yourselves. So it's a marginalized, privatized version of Christianity. Um, but I would say the ultimate goal, yeah, of the avatars of the self-invention culture is to usher us off the stage. And you know this well, man, as a historian of of philosophy, is this is an old, old conviction. It right. goes back, I mean, at least the beginning of the Enlightenment, where there was this kind of secularist assumption that religion will kind of naturally fade away. You see it in, in Rousseau, and you see it in Marx, certainly, and many other figures that, you know, we'll, we'll kind of... Um, uh, slough off the skin of religion as we move forward in our in our progress. Well, that still haunts the minds of a lot of people today. Um, religion will just fade away. Of course, <laughs> the great counter um, claim is: look, it hasn't happened, has it? They've been saying this for hundreds of years right. now. Nietzsche, the death of God, you know, Sartre, and I, I, just line them up. Freud, all confidently predicting the end of religion, and we haven't gone away. So, I mean, I, in a way, I'm not so much concerned about that. That's an old, old hang-up of the secularist establishment, but it's proving itself false all the time. All right, so basically what we're seeing is that persecution is real, and we should expect persecution within the 21st century, okay? So that's one thing that we need to pay attention to. The second thing is, is that we need to believe these people. This isn't a facade. This is a reality that people are going to mock Christ. They're going to mock the church. They are going to mock us as Christians. We need to believe them. I find that to be a very uh, interesting idea that Bishop Barron is putting forth here. Okay, so we know that persecution is real. We know that bigotry is real. We know that we need to believe them and not see that it's a, a facade. So now how are we to respond as Christians? How are we to live into this reality? And how are we to respond to the persecution, the bigotry that we are confronted with uh, on a daily basis? Here is Bishop Barron's response. Let's dig into that in, in more detail at the scriptural level as well. Yeah, this, okay. um, this distinction that resistance does not mean passivity, but it also doesn't mean violence. Right. So some Christians may be heartened and, and inspired by your words, and yet still unclear on what resistance really means, especially in response to this, another biblical passage here. This is also from Matthew. Uh, this is in uh, Matthew 5. You have heard, you know this well, Bishop, you have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, you turn the other one to him as well. So 
How do we interpret what you've just said in light of, ma of uh, our Lord's words here? Well, take the eye for an eye. So that's violence is done to me. I do violence back. And he's saying that's not what I'm recommending. Don't resist in the worldly way. Don't resist in the, in the customary way. But look at this. Very interesting, that passage about the turning of the cheek. In Jesus' time, the, the left hand would have been considered unclean. You never use it for any kind of social interaction. So if you strike someone on the right cheek, that means you're striking them like this with the back of your right hand. That was the gesture toward an inferior, toward a slave or someone you consider an inferior. So what's Jesus saying? Someone strikes you on the right cheek, what do you do? Stand your ground and give them the other cheek. In other words, what are you saying? I refuse to cooperate with the world you're living in. I refuse to live on these terms. I'm not going to I'm not going to punch you or strike you back, but I'm not running away. I'm standing my ground, and by turning the other cheek, I'm mirroring back to you your own unjust aggression toward me. Now, once you see that, now look at the method of Gandhi. Look at the method of King. Look at the method of John Paul II. It's exactly what they were doing. An example I like to use with John Paul is um, this is way back at the height of, of the... the fearful period when there, there was, I remember, very real fear that the Russian troops are going to invade Poland right. and all that. John Paul goes to Poland and General Jaruzelski, maybe older folks will remember him, he was a, a Polish general who was running the government at the time and he wore these dark glasses, kind of a, kind of a sinister looking figure. And um, he welcomed John Paul at the airport when he arrived and he had his speech in his hand and it was shaking as he read it to John Paul. He, he was so nervous. And John Paul politely listened. And then they say he took his own speech and he went like this. He held it out to Jaruzelski like, I'm not afraid of you. Wow. His speech wasn't. And then he calmly read his speech. Well, then watch what he did in Poland. It was exactly this sort of King Gandhi approach. Is it sight after sight, even though they were trying to block him, they were trying to dissuade people. There was false information, but the people came out in huge numbers. And he talked about God, and he talked about human rights, and he talked about human dignity, and he talked about the danger of tyranny, and he just on and on and on. There was a, I heard about this actually from some of the folks who were there. He's in um, Krakow, right, his great archiepiscopal residence in Krakow. And he's leaning out the window and, uh, of, of the residence, and there's a huge crowd out there. And he's speaking, he's speaking these provocative things that were clearly anti-communist, clearly, you know. And the Vatican officials were inside behind him going, doesn't he know what he's doing? Can someone stop him? You know, because he wasn't playing the diplomatic game. Right. Well, he knew exactly what he was doing. And by God, it worked. You know, he, he so stirred the Polish people nonviolently. Not, not a shot was fired, you know. But so stirred the Polish people, and the Solidarity Movement emerged out of that, which then kind of swept its way across the Soviet bloc and eventually into the Soviet Union itself. And the evil empire, I remember when Ronald Reagan called it the evil empire, uh, it fell <laughs> with barely a shot being fired. So don't tell me that this kind of resistance doesn't have real social effectiveness. I've seen it mm -hmm. in my own lifetime. So that's how Christians resist. So the key here is, is that to resist and confront anti-Christian bigotry, to resist the persecution that we're going to experience as Christians. We resist by forgiveness, by turning the other cheek, by loving other people. That is the only thing that ever will change anything in this world. We believe them. We know we're going to be confronted with bigotry, with persecution. We know people are going to mock us. We know people are going to mock the gospel. We know people are going to mock the church, but we resist with forgiveness and love. And one thing I would add is we tell them the gospel. We continue to proclaim the gospel even amid the difficulties, even amid the the circumstances, uh, the persecution, all of these different things that we are confronted with, we continue to proclaim the message. Um, the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, as the apostle Paul tells us, right? It is foolishness to them. But we still continue to seek after them with love and continue to proclaim the gospel. This is how we resist anti-Christian bigotry. You're going to confront it. Are you aware of the mockery that is going on in the world? Are you aware of the problems that are 
just realities within this fallen world. We must respond with the gospel. We must resist with love, grace, mercy, truth, the fruits of the spirit, everything that is all-encompassing of the Christian life. And we are to love, we are to forgive, and we are to turn the other cheek. These are some of the things that I am taking from this video of Bishop Barron. I hope it has been beneficial to you. Please be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.